there's one person. I want you to imagine now. Okay? I'll just put it right there. Imagine with me. There's a virus. There's a plague. There's a disease that is spreading around the entire world. We're not talking about COVID. We're talking about something serious. Even more serious than COVID. And there's only one doctor that discovered the vaccine for this sickness. Only one. But the problem is now this doctor was speaking about it and he was teaching these companies how to make it and writing it down and documenting his findings. But then in the midst of this, this doctor, he went sick himself and he was about to die. And he left a piece of advice before he dies and he said, if you want to save yourself, then do this, this, and that. He mentioned a few things. And he mentioned actually one thing. He said, look, the simplest thing I could say at this point is do this and you're likely to be saved. Who in his right mind or who in her right mind would not do this thing? Can you tell me? Do you, do you guys understand the question? This doctor, he has this vaccine, he has the cure to the disease, and he died before prescribing, and the last thing he said was the prescription. He said the closest, easiest way to save yourself is by doing this. Would everyone do it or not? He said this is a, a killer disease. Of course we would do it. طيب. The doctor of our hearts here is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sallu ala Rasul. And as he was dying alayhi salatu wa salam bi abi huwa wa ummi. The last thing he said after weeks of sickness. After weeks of sickness. The last thing he said before dying. And wallah, there's no calamity more than the calamity of the death of Rasulullah. Wallahi, it is worse than losing anyone in our lifetime. Because the one who loved Rasulullah and understood what it meant to live around him, understood that they have the Qur'an walking in front of them. That they have the Shafi'ah, the one who will intercede for them Yom Al-Qiyamah, amongst them. But when they lost him, they lost the most precious and valuable thing in their lives. Subhanallah. So there's no calamity more than that. The last thing he died saying, alayhi salatu was salam, was, as-salat as-salah, wa ma malakat aymanakum. As-salat as-salah, la hadza fil islam li man tarak as-salah. The Prophet sallam died saying, tell my ummah to pray, 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 for indeed there's nothing in Islam for the one who can't even pray. There's nothing. Ya Allah. Ya Allah. Allahumma ighfir lana taqsirna fi salah. Ya Allah, forgive us for our shortcomings in salah. Ya Allah, forgive us for our unnecessary delaying of salah. Ya Allah, forgive us for our lack of khushu' in salah. Ya Allah, forgive us for thinking of other than you in our salah. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So now today, inshallah ta'ala, we are going to continue with Kitab al-Salah. As we began last week, we're going to continue with the ruh, the soul of this salah. Alhamdulillah. After the last week, we ended with some of the stories of the Sahaba and the Salaf in their state when they were praying. Do you remember when I said 
one of the Sahaba would stand in the Sahin of the Kaaba, in front of the Kaaba to pray, and birds would come and stand on his head from how still he was in Salah. The Sahaba would be blind, and they would still insist on going to Salat al-Fajr walking. Subhanallah. Some of the Sahaba were attacked by dogs in the midst of the night, but they insisted that they kept going to Fajr. They knew the value of Salah. They understood it. They believed it because, wallahi, you know, once a true Salah is tasted, and brothers, listen, listen to what I'm about to say. Once a person tastes the sweetness of a proper Salah, they will never leave it. For all of those who are iffy about Salah, it's on and off. You delay it. Sometimes you, 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 know, you miss out a salah here and there. Put them all at the end of the day together. Or say, you know, subhanAllah, ya Allah, I prayed Jum'ah this week. Alhamdulillah, I'm good. For all of those, you know what the diagnosis is? It's simple. You haven't really prayed yet. Because wallah, if you pray truly with khushu'a, with its arkan, with its wajibat, with its sunan, with its devotion, with the istihdar, with thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the way you should be thinking during salah, with blocking off everything around you, then subhanAllah, this is when the person really prayed. And wallahi, look, how many of you tried real, a real thing? Like, let's say like orange juice. You tried real fresh squeezed sweet orange juice sweet the moment you try it the moment you try it you can't leave it for those of you who like the citrus fruits you know but you might have liked a certain other orange juice growing up that was fake it was orange drink it was flavor it was water with some flavoring in it the moment you drink the flavor you can't, subhanAllah, you're like, man, I can't drink this stuff anymore. It's done. It's over. And likewise, the one who tastes salah properly, they'll never go back to leaving it because it's a sweetness in their life. Ya Allah, bless our hearts with your khushu'a, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So, here the Mu'allif, rahmanallah wa iya, he says, وَعْلَمْ أَنَّ لِلصَّلَاةِ أَرْكَانًا وَوَاجِبَاتْ وَسُنًا Salah has pillars and obligations and recommended matters. When we talk about pillars and wajibat and sunan, right, obligations and, and recommended, recommended matters in salah, we're thinking of fiqh, okay, standing up, reciting fatha, doing ruku' with a perfect 90, de 90 degree angle, going down on your knees versus your hands, or hands versus your knees, moving your finger into shahud, saying that the shahud. We're thinking of all this, but let's see what the Mu'allif rahimahullah says. He said, وَرُوحُهَا But the soul of it. Now we're talking about the wajibat, the arkan wajibat and sunan. He's saying, وَرُوحُهَا النِّيَّةُ وَالْإِخْلَاصُ وَالْخُشُوعُ وَحُضُورُ الْقَلْبِ Pure intention is the first. The pillar of the soul. Remember when I gave the example of the dead bird? You like birds, right? You said, you like parrots, what not, imagine, like, oh, I love this, the Indian parrot. I get you the beautiful Indian parrots, green with the orange beak, and I bring it to you dead. It's offensive. Like, what are you trying to break my heart? Now I feel bad for this thing. And likewise is the salah that is dead when you offer it to Allah. How? It's more offensive. Subhanallah. And the khushu'a, we're going to talk about these, inshallah, as we go in. He said, وَمَا عَدَمْ حُضُورَ الْقَلْبِ لَا يَحْصُلْ الْمَقْصُودِ بِالْأَذْكَارِ وَالْمُنَاجَاهِ لِأَنَّ النُطْقَ إِذَا لَمْ يُعْرِبْ عَمَّا فِي الضَّمِيرِ كَانَ بِمَنْزِلَةْ الْهَذَيَانِ No, no, this is, very, this is very deep. He said, the asas, like you know a heart is connected to salah, when a heart, is connected to Allah. It wants something from Him. It understands that Allah has something that we need. 
Allah has contentment. Allah has pleasure in this dunya and the next. Allah has the saving of us from the hellfire. Allah can fix all of my matters. Allah can correct everything in this dunya. My finances are messed up. My studies are messed up. My family is messed up. My car is messed up. My job is messed up. Everything is screwed up. And the only one that can fix it is who? Only Allah. So the heart understands this. The heart of who? A mu'min that is khasha. A mu'min that is what? Khasha. Okay? طيب. He said, but this doesn't happen when the person is just speaking and there's no munajah, there's nothing inside there. It doesn't understand how in need it is of Allah. It doesn't get it. So how is this person going to truly understand what they're saying? It's going to be like hadayan, you know, like sleep talking. You know how a person talks in their sleep? Wal-a'yadu billah. You ever woke up your brother, or your sister, your son, or your daughter? Like, dude, you had the most insane experience last night. Oh, what happened? I don't know. You must have been in Six Flags, and I think you were on a roller coaster, and you're going up and down and going crazy and talking to your friends. Really? He doesn't remember a thing. And likewise is the person that stands up and prays. On the day of judgment, oh, you said, oh, I don't remember a thing of it. Why? Because Allah does not want the words. Allah does not need the words. Allah does not want the movement or need the movement. Allah does not want the beautiful garment or the smell or the nice shape up or oh, making sure that all oh, my sujood. Okay, these are things we do because Allah wants them. But what did this action sprout from? Where did it come out from? What was what launched it? What got it to come? And that's what we need to focus on. You know when you're sitting at home, watching a movie, watching the Super Bowl, the football game, there's something that you really need. Subhanallah. And, and, and you're just like, no, I, I want to I go salli. I want to go pray. Right now, I want the ajr of jama'ah. And you get up. And you make wudu. And you're about to go. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. And you make wudu. And you're about to go. Subhanallah. Think of one thing, one thing. What is it that got me to leave what I'm doing to get up and go to masjid? Is it me wanting to see my friends? Is it me not having anything better to do? Is it me not liking the show that I'm watching? Is it me hoping to see someone on the way to the masjid? Is it me of scared of mom or dad nagging me? Or is it me wanting to tell my friends, yeah, I've been consistently coming to the masjid to show off? What is it that got the person to get up and go to the masjid? What is it that got the person to get up and pray? You know that? That intention right there, that niyyah and that ikhlas, is the soul. That is what Allah attains. That right there, that little thing that might take you a little moment. Like they say, Hunayha, you know? Hunayha, just a moment. Take. You stop and you think about it for a millisecond and it sits in your heart. That is what Allah wants. And when that is pure, Wallah, Wallah, your salah would be different. Because khushu'ah doesn't begin when you just snap into salah. I see some brothers and sisters, mashallah, they're texting, they're joking, they're shoving each other before salah, or they're running to the masjid, right? They're just in a rush to do what? And then they expect to come and be khushu'ah. Khushu'ah begins when you get off your couch, when you get off your desk, when you decide to leave your job, and you think of the reward Allah prepared. And you think of the power Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to change your affairs. When you think of how Allah can fix every problem in your life, that moment, that is when khushu' begins. Because that idea is carried with you until you get here. And then when you say, Allahu Akbar, do you know why we lift our hands? Why do we lift our hands, ya jama'at? What's the, do you know lifting the hands? Is that 
sunan or wajibat or arkan? Like, do we have to? Is salah invalid if we don't say this? Or is Allahu Akbar the rukun, the pillar? What is it? It's saying Allahu Akbar. So if I just say Allahu Akbar, is my salah okay? Yes, in fiqh. But why, what's this movement? You know what it is? I asked one of my shuyukh. He said, he said, this is throwing everything behind you. This is, when you do this, it's like saying, Ya Rabb, the dunya is behind me, and you are in front of me, Ya Rabb. Ya Allah, what a beautiful feeling, Ya Jama'ah. When you throw everything, when you throw everything, you see this gesture, it means a lot to Allah. Maybe to us, we just got up, we grew up like, oh, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, and then people like start focusing on how and the angle of your hands and no, no, forget about all that. The moment you do this, it's a small gesture, but it means, Ya Rabb, nothing is more important than you. Huh? That's it, you throw it, you say Allahu Akbar. Because there had to be a physical, a physical movement connected to the word Allahu Akbar and the word that enters you into Salah, right? There's a physical movement. Tayyib. He said, let's see. Now, he said, وَلَمْ يَكُنِ الْقَلْبِ He said, uh, He said, لِأَنَّهُ إِذَا كَانَ الْمَقْصُودِ مِنَ الْقِيَامِ الْخِدْمَةِ وَمِنَ الْرُكُوعِ السُّجُودِ وَالذُّلْ وَالتَّعْظِيمِ وَلَمْ يَكُنِ الْقَلْبِ حَاضِرًا لَمْ يَحْصُلِ الْمَقْصُودِ He said, if the intent of the movement of salah, of standing up, you know when we stand up in salah and we're looking, if the intent of standing up is, Ya Rabb, I'm standing and I'm ready for you. I'm ready to do anything for you. And the intent behind sujood is to say, Ya Rabb, I am humiliating myself. I am humbling myself. I am lowering myself to you. You are greater than me. And my head is on this ground. If that's the intent of salah, if that's the whole purpose of its movement, right? If the movements that were prescribed, then, and, and for rakua, the intent is what? Respect, you know, you bow for respect. If that was, if the heart is not there while doing it, then did these movements do anything? As a matter of fact, they might do the opposite. Imagine someone who doesn't know the greatness of Allah and doesn't understand how powerful Allah is, doesn't understand how Allah can impact their life, but they are used to lowering their heads in sujood for other than Allah, for people to, to see. Or because the culture just deemed that, خلص, I just grew up, it's normal to put, bow down my head and put on the floor. That has the complete opposite effect. It makes a person more degradable. You get, this head should not bow for anything than Allah. So when a person is going down to sujood, ya jama'ah, if they don't have this feeling like, man, you know, I, I don't want to do this, you know, going bowing down, putting my head on the floor, you feel this, but you're like, no, only Allah deserves this, and that's why I'm bowing. And then you go down to sujood. You see that moment, that feeling? That is the humbleness. That is the humbleness. Ya jama'ah, Insha'Allah, uh, can you a little bit? Okay, alhamdulillah. So now, now look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al Hajj. Look at this ayah. Allah does not benefit or take from the meat that you slaughter for him, this is an Eid al-Adha or in Hajj. Does Allah benefit or in your Aqiqah? Does Allah benefit from the meat? Does Allah eat the meat? Does Allah taste the meat? Does Allah benefit in any way from the meat? No. Does the blood benefit Allah in any way? The spillage? No, it doesn't. But what does Allah get from you slaughtering the sheep or the cow or the camel? Taqwa. Allah wants to see your heart. Okay, what? How close did you get to Allah by doing this? 
That's really what Allah is looking for. That's really what Allah wants. And until we start seeing what's behind these actions, ya jama'a, we're not going to be murabbin. We're, we're, we're not going to do the tahdeeb of our nafs. Right? Yani. He said, وَالْمَعَانِي الَّتِي تَتِمُّ بِهَا حَيَاتُ الصَّلَاةِ كَثِيرًا And the meanings that salah, the meanings that salah is completed with, are many, but we'll mention some. He said, المعنى الأول حضور القلب كما ذكرنا ومعناه أن يفرغ القلب من غير ما هو ملابس به أو ملابس له وسبب ذلك الهمة فإنه متى أهمك أمر حضر قلبك ضرورة He said the first معنى the first meaning is that your heart should be there and what it means is that your heart before salah should be empty of anything other than salah anything other than Allah and anything other than what's wearing it you know what he said he said ملابس له you know what ملابس means يا جماعة ملابس means uh, ملابس like, like what we're wearing and when you're wearing something, can you can you imagine a bodybuilder going to show his muscles, but he has this wide, extra large shirt on, and he's flexing and he's doing all this stuff, hoping that they could see it through the shirt. Hey, Jama, your shirt's khalas. You're losing the competition. It's over. There's nothing that can help you, right? Why? Because it's mulabis. And likewise, the heart that's covered, it's covered. There's something wearing it. Allah cannot see it because there's a hindrance. There's a deterrence between your heart and Rabbil Alameen. There's something. It could be your wife. It could be your kids. It could be your job. It could be your money. It could be your car. Your friends. A conversation you were having right before Salah. A message you were sending. Social media chat. Uh, you know that you were just scrolling down, binge watching right before Salah. It could be any of that. Something you just watched. It could be there. And that is the cover, the mulabis, you know, that covers your heart from Allah. So make sure whatever is there that's stressing you or concerning you is taken off prior to salah. The second meaning is التفهم لمعنى الكلام فإنه أمر وراء حضور القلب To understand the words as much as we can. And this is for those who, you know, these surah that we recite, even for those who don't understand Arabic. Don't make this a deterrence from this. Because even though you don't understand Arabic, you can still read the tafsir. You could still remember the surah and understand the surah. All the surahs that we recite are mainly from where? From surah Qaf and down. Yani that's what we mainly recite in our salahs. Right? What's to prevent us from understanding the meaning of those surahs? From diving into the tafsir. So that the moment the imam says Qaf, you remember exactly what he's recite. The moment he says what did he recite in, 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 the, in the Salah? Surat Al-Muzzammil. The moment he recites Surat Al-Muzzammil, boom, you, you remember Surat Al-Muzzammil. You know exactly what, what he's saying. Your heart can be there with it. Right? And then he continues on. He said, وَعِلَاجُ ذَلِكَ إِنْ كَانَ مِنَ الْمَوَادِ الظَّاهِرَ بِقَطْعِ مَا يُشْغِلْ السَّمْعِ وَالْبَصَرِ وَهُوَ الْقُرْبُ مِنَ الْقِبْلَةِ والنظر إلى موضع السجود والاحتراز في الصلاة من المواضع المنقوشة. He said, and there's things that we can do to establish this خشوع خشوع, which is what, which is blocking what busies your listening and your sight. Right? Some people praying. You're in a public area, and mashallah, you know it's in the middle of the summer and you're in the middle of a shopping mall or shopping plaza, and everybody's passing in front of you. So the Prophet ﷺ, if his wife passed in front of him, that'll break his salah, right? Why? Because, khalas, your, your mind is gone. Did you know that, by the way? You know if a woman passes in front of a man in salah, not a man in front of a woman, right? Because the women don't like us that much. <laughs> they can live without us. <laughs> right? But the man who can't live without a woman, and if she passes in front of you, what happens? It breaks the salah. I mean, you're outside looking at everything. Of course, your salah is going to... So, to lower the gaze, right? And the next thing is to what? To block whatever is... You know, sometimes there's music blasted. You're in a store, you know, in a restaurant somewhere. The music is blasted. And you just try to out, 
you know, Alhamdulillah, you know, if it's the only place, khair, you know, you have to do what you have to do because it's a lot of time. But if you have a, pl a place to choose, no, go pray outside in the parking lot where there's nothing to listen to. Don't distract yourself from Allah. And to look at the place of sujood, to look at where you're about to prostrate on and to avoid this. You know, you know, some people have musallas, they buy them. I don't know where they get them from. I'm walking in Medina, they got these musallas, they got pictures and all that. One time the Prophet ﷺ was praying on a musalla and it had images that resembled that of animals. It resembled. Like, you know, and the Prophet ﷺ, when he finished salah, he took that, he picked it up, he said, Ya Aisha, please get rid of this. Give it to somebody. I, I don't want it. She said, Why? He said, I couldn't focus in my salah. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Cut everything that takes out the focus. And by the way, we still have a long way to establish our salah, inshallah. We ask Allah to perfect our salah. We ask Allah to increase our khushua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us with uh, the siyam and qiyam of Ramadan coming up, inshallah. We ask Allah to prepare our hearts for Ramadan. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us and unite us all in Jannat al firdaus and to be from amongst those who Allah says right now, qumu maghfuran lakum. Get up and Allah has forgiven you. Qad buddilat sayyatikum hasanat. All of your sins have been transformed into good deeds. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen.